Greetings. I'm Mike Teitelbaum, Director of Jazz Studies at Ithaca College in gorgeous central New York. This is the first in what will be a series of videos on simple melodic embellishment. It's actually a follow-up. Years ago, I posted a video on this topic, and it got pretty popular. But soon after, I realized it was not going to be sufficient to really teach the topic. So, I wrote a book. And I'll be making more videos you can use to practice some of the exercises from the book. In just a few minutes, you'll need your instrument in your hand, so get it ready. First, what do I mean by simple melodic embellishment, and how is it different from any other methods of learning improvising? I remember way back when I was just getting started. Okay, well, not that young. That's more like it. I remember attending workshops with improvisation masters. They would often say things like, to improvise, start with the melody of a song and uh, change it a little, embellish it, you know, improvise. Uh, no, I don't know. First of all, I thought you weren't supposed to use a word in its definition. So how do you learn to embellish a melody? For me, at first, I just learned by trying and failing a lot. I played songs with my friends, took improvised solos, badly at first, but eventually I started getting better. I had one of those aha moments in music theory class. We were studying Bach, learning about some melodic techniques, and I realized that these were the same techniques I had just heard Charlie Parker using in improvisation class. Charlie Parker uses passing tones and neighbor tones too. Whoa, Bach was copying Charlie Parker. Well, to be fair, I guess the timeline was the other way around. But I learned about Charlie Parker first, so that's how it felt at the time. Some notes are chord tones. These notes define the chord of the moment, the harmonic landscape of a melody, like guideposts. Without these guideposts, a listener cannot fully perceive the melody within its harmonic environment, the lush landscape that fills a melody with its emotional core. Other notes are more decorative. These are the embellishments. These embellishment notes are not part of the chord. They're non-chord tones outside the chord. Without these decorations, you can still perceive a melody and the chords they go with, but that melody won't be as ornate or as colorful, perhaps not even as beautiful as when you include these embellishments. Ooh yeah, I said it, embellishments are beautiful. Okay, so melodies contain both chord tones and non-chord tones. I think of the primary chord tones to be equivalent to consonants in English, while the embellishments are like the vowels. Did you know that you can still read a sentence even with all the vowels removed? There's a great word for this, disemvoweling. Cute, huh? Jeff Bezos once suggested removing all the vowels from articles in his newspaper, the Washington Post. Actually, I don't think that's the craziest idea. The reader can still understand the meaning of this sentence because of their familiarity with English and the context of the vowel-less words, right? But back to music. I just compared chord tones to consonants and embellishments to vowels. Let's test this comparison because I suggested you could still recognize a melody without any embellishments. Listen to this melody with all the embellishments removed. Did you recognize it? That's right, it's J.S. Bach's two-part invention in F major. Do you agree that the tune was still recognizable even with all the embellishments, the non-chord tones removed? But it wasn't as ornate, or here I go again, as beautiful. That's the concept of improvising with simple melodic embellishment. Start with a simple melody, 
harmonic guideposts, and embellish the notes using straightforward techniques honed by composers and improvisers over hundreds of years, passing tones, neighbor tones, appoggiaturas, and others. To get there, we'll break down the process into four components. Learning the embellishment techniques, and not just on paper, but on our instruments and in our voices. Applying these techniques to embellish simple songs. Composing our own simple melodies. After all, composing is just improvising slowly. And then embellishing our own melodies. When you can put all these steps together in real time, you are improvising. If composing is improvising slowly, improvising is just composing quickly. To get started learning embellishments, we need a very simple melody to practice on. We'll make a short melody right from a chord so that it will contain nothing but chord tones. Here's our chord, F major. A major chord consists of the first note of the scale, then the third note of the scale, and lastly, the fifth note of the scale. We're going to melodicize this chord, make a little melody from the chord, up and down. You got your instrument ready? Note that if you play a transposing instrument like B flat trumpet, clarinet, or tenor sax, or E flat instruments like alto or barry sax, or perhaps you play in bass clef like the trombone or the bass, there are separate lines for you transposed below so you can read along. Okay, here we go. Play or sing along. One, two, three, four. Okay, it's not a great melody, but we're just getting started. We'll start practicing embellishments with neighbor tones. I love the term neighbors. Growing up in Rochester, we had neighbors on both sides. Next door, up the street, were the Blooms. Down one house were the Kents. Dr. Kent was our family dentist. When I stepped up to the neighbor's house to borrow a cup of flour, or stepped down to get a tooth pulled out, I'd always step back home right afterwards. In melodies, a neighbor tone is a non-chord tone approached from a chord tone by step, a single scale note, then return back to that same chord tone afterwards. A neighbor could be an upper neighbor where you go up the scale from a chord tone, then come back, or a lower neighbor where you go down the scale from a chord tone, then come back. Okay, do you remember our simple chord tone melody from before? We're going to add neighbor tones to it, to ornament it, embellish it. The original melody will still be audible, even though each of the notes are ornamented with an embellishment. Each of these original melody notes is circled so you can identify it. For each note in the melody, we're going to add upper neighbors, the next note higher. We can call these diatonic upper neighbors because the gesture goes one note higher in the scale. Notice that because we're in the key of F major, the upper diatonic neighbor of A is not B natural, but B flat. Now you play or sing. Three, four. Let's do it again in tempo. Make sure the rhythm feels good. One, two, three, four. Now we'll do the same thing with lower neighbors. For this exercise, we'll do lower neighbors as half steps. Instead of going one note down in the scale, we'll always go one note down on the piano, what might be to a black key instead of a white key, for instance. We can call these chromatic lower neighbors. I really like the term chromatic because it implies color. Chromatic neighbors are more colorful. In jazz, we call these types of phrases bluesy, or we might call the notes blue notes. Okay, you get ready to play or sing again. Three, four.
good measure, let's do it again. One, two, three, four. You may wonder why I chose diatonic upper neighbors, but chromatic lower neighbors. Could I have done both the same type, or with those two reversed? Well, sure. But those don't feel like the right colors for this exercise. So should you practice them on your own with different patterns? Sure, get down with your bad self. I'll save those for jazz improvisation using complex melodic embellishment. Maybe I'll write that book when I retire. You know, this one took 10 years. So the pattern for all these exercises will be to use diatonic neighbors when they're upper, chromatic neighbors when lower. It will facilitate our learning to apply a consistent pattern to our practice. Let's test that theory by adding double neighbors to the little major triad melody, including both upper and lower neighbors before returning to each melody note. I'll show you what I mean. Start with the melody note, upper diatonic neighbor, lower chromatic neighbor, melody note. Then right on to the next melody note, upper neighbor, lower neighbor, melody note. Then right on to the next melody note, upper, lower, melody note, melody note. Kind of fun, right? Because this embellishment pattern is so tightly packed, we'll practice it in three ways. First, where we only add double neighbors to notes on the downbeat of each measure. Second, where we only add them to the notes on beat three of each measure. And lastly, where we add them to every half note, where the resulting exercise will be the most dense. First, add double neighbors to the half notes on the downbeat of each bar. One, two, three, four. Let's do it again, just a little quicker. One, two, three, four. Now we're gonna add double neighbors to the half notes on beat three of each melody bar. One, two, three, four. And let's do it a little bit quicker. One, two, three, four. Finally, the most dense version where we add double neighbors to all half notes of the melody. One, two, three, four. And let's do that a little quicker. One, two, three, four. So we don't lose track of the point here. Even though that exercise was very ornate with lots of densely packed notes, you could still hear the original melody, right? The reason we're practicing these dense embellishments on every melody note is to improve our own facility. In real world improvising situations, I wouldn't use the exact same embellishment technique for each and every chord tone, but I certainly need to be able to. And I need to be able to do it in every key on my instrument. That's the only way to develop the flexibility and skill to apply this level of embellishment to spontaneous melodies in real time. You know, improvising. If you're ready to work on these exercises in all 12 keys, there's a link down in the description to PDFs and audio accompaniments. There's also a practice grid so you can keep track of your progress. That'll keep you going for a while.
The book goes into greater depth, including neighbor tones on other types of triads, as well as lots of other embellishments. Well, that's it for today. Next time, we'll learn a simple song and embellish it with interesting rhythms and neighbor tones. Then later will come the other embellishments, passing tones, appoggiaturas, blue notes, chromatic enclosures, escape tones, anticipations, suspensions, implied chords, substitutions, all the list goes on and on.